Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Medical Minute. I'm Dr. Rick. And I'm Dr. Danny. We're excited to bring you a special guest today for this two-part episode. We told it's going to be two parts because I think we have a lot to talk about in colorectal cancer. That's right, Rick. We're so happy to be here with uh, Dr. Alex Green. He's our special guest today. Welcome, Alex. Yep, thanks so much for having me, guys. I'm excited to be here. So, Dr. Crean, if you could kind of give the listeners sort of your background, where you come from, how you end up being an uh, excellent colorectal surgeon. Yeah, sure. So, uh, I'm a, a colorectal surgeon over at Memorial Hospital, uh, and I've been here for about three and a half years. I grew up actually in Augusta, Georgia, so not too far away. Uh, that's where I did my medical school. Uh, I did my general surgical training up in Philadelphia, and I did an extra year of colorectal training in New York, uh, but wanted to come back down south. So Jacksonville was a, a natural fit for us, and we love it down here. Um, and I, you know, I really focus on taking care of only colorectal problems, both benign uh, and malignant, in terms of colorectal cancer uh, for the patients of Jacksonville. No, I think, you know... Um I guess that's the part we probably don't see too much as the benign side of things. Um, and obviously most of this talk will talk about colorectal cancer, but Alex, what kind of things do you cover in the benign spectrum that you, you manage? Yeah. So that, you know, that's the stuff that really pays the bills, um, <laughs> you know, uh, hemorrhoids, any kind of anorectal problem, pain, bleeding, things like that. Um, we do, uh, take care of patients a lot with diverticulitis as well, you know, which is a benign condition that affects a lot of Americans. Um, but then, you know, really the passion is taking care of the colorectal cancer patients as well, because um, it's, a, it's a whole different uh, treatment population than the benign patients. I think, you know, part of the reason we wanted you to join us today is taking care of cancer patients in general, but especially colorectal patients is a team approach, multidisciplinary involving not just, you know, us doctors, but, you know, nurses and coordinators and nutritionists and um, everything all along down the line, radiology, pathology. So, we can kind of get into some of that. I don't know, Danny, do you have any thoughts about sort of just kind of that multidisciplinary approach to rectal cancer care? You're exactly right, Rick. I think it's key to have great communication between all of us. And I think as the guidelines change, you know, we have our own, uh, you know, spots in the care and how we deliver uh, chemotherapy on my side of things with medical oncology. Um, but we have to be in constant communication about the timing of how we sequence our therapies and uh, it really helps to have good communication with you, Alex and Rick, and just making sure that the, the care is seamless and that we get the patients through it with hopefully, you know, manageable toxicities. Yeah, you know, I agree. I, you know, it, it's always tough to get the diagnosis of colorectal cancer. You know, obviously, that, you know, no one wants to hear that. Uh, but I try to encourage patients that now is a good time if you have to have something like that to deal with it. Um, the treatments are very well tolerated. You know, it's it's not the same kind of diagnosis you would get 20, 30 years ago. You know, the, the technology with chemotherapy and radiation is excellent. Um, you know, we do our part with robotic or minimally invasive surgery. Um, and it's, it's just very different than if your parents or grandparents had the same kind of disease. You know, it's a much better outlook. Yeah, I think it, and it, like you were saying, Danny and Alex, I mean, it changes by like the year. I feel like there's always something new or you know, coming along the pipe that you may not even think about and realize and turns out it's going to be a big change to practice. Yeah, I think one of the um, things we should talk about before we kind of get into the weeds of some of the specifics of how colorectal cancer is managed is sort of how is this picked up for our, you know, patients, families who are listening, you know, what are things they should look for that may prompt them to seek medical attention. And then, of course, we should talk about screening with colonoscopies and other things. I don't know if either one of you wants to jump off on any of that but what are some of the things you routinely tell you know patients and what what should they be looking for or what should they be thinking about uh, it's important i think to differentiate between um all the new tests we have available to de detect cancer we have blood tests we have you know antigen based tests to test the stool for different um you know possible markers of cancer and then we have colonoscopy which still you know is is the main way we detect precancerous polyps to remove them before they turn into cancer so i advise patients to really adhere to the guidelines about when they should undergo their screening colonoscopies um, some of it's based on risk and their family history i think alex can dive into that a little bit more but um you know these these blood tests and stool tests are not um, replacing colonoscopy, uh, and, and unless, you know, you have a patient who's extremely low risk, 
who who opts against colonoscopy. So, Alex, can you tell us a little bit about how you use colonoscopy or even sigmoidoscopy in your practice? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I think that's talking about the benign stuff. It, it kind of does tie in with this because more often, so, sometimes we'll see a patient that gets sent over for a presumed benign condition, such as hemorrhoids. Maybe they're having some bleeding. And maybe they're pretty young, you know, they could be in their 20s, 30s, early 40s. Um, but that's why we always have to talk about the risk factors for colorectal cancer. You know, and some of those can be if you've had a family member with previous colorectal cancer, especially if they had it at a young age, and if it's either a brother or sister or mom or dad, you know, a close relative. Um, if you have any other exposures or known risk for such as inflammatory bowel disease, you know, so that's Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, you know, something you want to pick up or if a family member had it. Um, if you're having those risk factors, it's reasonable to do a colonoscopy, you know, either with a surgeon or a gastroenterologist early, you know, because right now we know the, the new recommended age is 45, um, but it's not unreasonable to do it to someone in their 20s, you know. That's the best way, I think, to treat colorectal cancer is to, is to screen for it and pick it up before it ever happens, you know. So if you can have a polyp removed by a colonoscopy, you know, that, that can save you a lot of treatment down the future. Uh, so it's always reasonable to ask. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's, I mean, that point about the age being lowered speaks to, I think, what we're seeing both objectively, what the literature is showing, but also anecdotally. I think we're all mm-hmm. seeing, unfortunately, younger and younger patients get diagnosed with colorectal cancer, even those without any clear risk factors or strong family history. And so I think there's clearly a some sort of pair, you know, shift in the epidemiology of this disease. And I think screening guidelines are catching up. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if those that age gets pushed lower, you yeah. know, over the subsequent years and decades. Um, I, I guess one question I've always had, Alex, in your practice, obviously folks with um, inflammatory bowel disease or other things, you would recommend usually some sort of colonoscopy mm-hmm. um, at the minimum. How do you um, guide patients with maybe things like hemorrhoids or something maybe on the more benign end, at what point would you maybe say, okay, now would be the time to do it, even if they fall outside that, sure. you know, standard guideline window? Yeah, I mean, for example, if, if we're seeing a younger patient in their 20s for hemorrhoids, um, and, and, you know, I examine them, I do what's called an anoscopy, which is a very short um, scope of just the, the anal and rectal area. Um, if, obviously, if we visualize hemorrhoids that look substantial, we, you know, we undergo treatments for that. That's either office based or surgical. Um, if those patients are doing great, their symptoms resolve and they're young, probably okay to just watch them. But if we don't find anything terribly impressive on examination or despite treatment, you know, the symptoms aren't resolving, especially bleeding, uh, I think it's very reasonable to pursue something else like a colonoscopy. You know, because not to try to scare people, because it's still very rare in young patients, but there are patients that are well below the screening age that we're picking up colorectal cancer in. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think, I mean, you're seeing, obviously, patients who are already getting to you, of course, are going to be more likely to have some sort of, you know, issue along the, the GI tract. So I think it's very reasonable what, what you're describing um, and certainly what we're seeing with the younger age of patients getting diagnosed. And Alex, you're seeing patients uh, at a younger age independent of uh, inflammatory bowel disease in yeah. a lot more cases. Is yeah, right? we, we are seeing younger and young patients, um, you know, without any identifiable risk factors um, that are sometimes, you know, even in their 20s um, with Mm -hmm. showing up with colorectal cancer. Um, So it never hurts to ask, you know, if you have a primary care physician, um, if you have a gastroenterologist, OBGYNs, you know, um, it never hurts to ask, you know, because you can always be screened. Um, I don't think you're ever going to regret it. Um, If there's nothing, then great. Then you're good for 10 years. And if we find something, then we found it early, and it's much more treatable. You know, I think the earlier we find things, even if it's not good news, the treatment options are much wider than if it's found later in the game. Yeah, I yeah. think the important point is not to ignore bleeding, because even yeah. if it comes out benign and due to hemorrhoid or some other cause, no harm, harm or foul yeah. there, that you're getting checked out and making sure that you don't have a condition which could take your life. In mm-hmm. the end. Yeah, I think you took the words out of my mouth. I mean, it's so easy to ignore you know, those symptoms and put them on the back burner. And obviously we're all busy and doing a million things, you know, but at some point, you know, it can be a way your body's trying to tell you something uh, for lack of a better way to think about it. But yeah. What got you into colorectal surgery? Now you go through a general surgery Mm -hmm. residency, right? And then kind of opt for fellowship. What kind of 
directed you into that specialty? Um, you know, I like to say I did it for the jokes. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. but, um, you can it, help me out then. Yeah. That's for sure. Yeah. It, <laughs> it, it provides it. Yeah, I noticed um, you didn't have a joke. Prepared. I do have a joke today, but I'll tell it at the end. Of oh, okay. Looking forward okay. to that. That's why Thank I came, you. actually. <laughs> Darn um, it. It's a really wide range of disease processes across a lot of ages. You know, we can yeah. see inflammatory bowel disease patients in their, you know, their teenage years. Um, you know, I see people all the way up to in their 90s, and it spans from um, inflammatory bowel disease, you know, rectal disease, colorectal cancer. So you see a lot of different types of people, a lot of different types of personalities. Um, and then the treatments are very, very well. We do very big surgeries, you know, robotic surgery. Where we're taking out parts of the colon, putting people back together. And then we take care of very small things where we do office-based treatments for hemorrhoids. Um, so it doesn't, to me, it never gets monotonous. Mm -hmm. um, and you just have a very diverse range of conditions that you're able to help people with. Um, that's what really drew me to colorectal surgery. Yeah. Now, when we, when I think about, you know, seeing a new patient with colorectal cancer, uh, I'll tell the audience, treating colon cancer is different than treating rectal cancer. So we, we have different algorithms for that. But how would you say the treatment surgically has changed, say, over the past five to 10 years when you have a new patient who is a surgical candidate to remove their colon cancer? And typically that's done with removing part of the colon. How have the modalities changed for, for the better? And, and I think only better. I, I doubt it's gotten worse over time, but <laughs> yeah. for the better, how, how would you describe that? Now that that's a great question. I, you know, I think when we're seeing people for the first time that have a newly diagnosed colorectal cancer that potentially needs surgery, Everyone has in the back of their mind, um, you know, the mother, cousin, brother that had an ostomy bag. You know, am I going to need a bag for this? Um, the answer to that is almost frequently, is almost always no. Um, so we're able to really eliminate that, do stuff more electively. With, with robotic laparoscopic surgery, we're able to do the same surgery that was done before through a large incision, through multiple small incisions. Um, and we're really seeing that helps speed up recovery, it helps minimize pain, it helps people take less narcotic pain medications, which is crucial in today's medical world. And then it gets people to whatever other treatment they may need faster. You know, will it be chemotherapy, radiation, um, because you're not having to worry about healing a large incision or anything like that. Uh, and and it's, it's really changing the way we surgically can treat patients. And we can do things for patients that are much older or sicker that before may have kind of gotten written off and said, you know, you know you're not the best candidate for anything not much to do. I think it's, I mean, yeah, obviously just speaking anecdotally and mm -hmm. secondhand wise, I mean, it's, I think what's crazy to me to see is some of the operations that, you know, Alex and other colorectal surgeons can do in these patients who, you know, I think before we would have said, oh, maybe they couldn't handle or tolerate uh, a larger surgery, but these folks, I mean, come out great. And I mean, they're out of the hospital in like no time. And, mm -hmm. you know, you see, you know, we see them a few weeks later and they look like they barely had, you know, anything happen, and that's what they report to. So I think it's a testament to your field and, and you alls skill level that these things have evolved over time. Yeah, and that's where the team approach really comes in, though, because we're, we're communicating, you know. I, I, don't, I try not to do surgery in a vacuum. You know, I, I know enough about the chemotherapies and the radiation to try to factor that in mm -hmm. where maybe my part is done, but then I'm hurting the next part of treatment. So mm -hmm. that's why I think the communication is key that we all have. Yeah, I think sure. the, um, I mean, we'll probably hit on it a little bit more later, but I mean, a tumor board or a multidisciplinary discussion, in my opinion, for these cases is absolutely mandatory. Um, you know, outside of an emergent situation where something needs to be done to save somebody's life, I really think that, you know, get the opinions of everyone, um, you know, not only our three specialties, but all the other specialties that are involved in cancer care. So a recommendation can be really be made where it's not done in a vacuum, as you said, and it's really done taking kind of the whole, you know, patient picture into context and what the different treatment options are. Right. There are a lot of ideas that are thrown out in tumor boards and there may not be a right, uh, one right answer for the case, but I think you get kind of the consensus and you get the right, right approach to treatment majority of the time. How have you seen the shift to robotic surgery now compared to, um, prior where you were doing more laparoscopes or, or even open surgeries, are you using robotic in a majority of your cases? For, for me, unless it's actually, even if it's urgent or emergent, sometimes we're able to do it robotically, but for everything that's planned, we take a robotic approach and, oh, and patients great. know, you know, if they've had significant previous surgery, if they've had something else, you know, happen yeah. intra abdominally, there's a chance we may have to make a, you know, a larger incision. Um, but we, we really do our best to try to do it robotically just to minimize the, the physiologic insult to the patient. Mm -hmm. Um, and it, it really does 
let us do more for a wider range of patient population. And the precision of what you're doing is much better with the robot compared to doing laparoscopes. Yeah, so, you know, the way, you know, because some patients kind of misperceive it, and I don't blame them, mm -hmm. um, that, you know, the robot's really doing the surgery. I, I think at some point that will come, mm -hmm. um, and we, they won't need us anymore. <laughs> um, but right now, I, I basically tell the them, like, it's a very, very fancy scalpel. I you know, see. it allows me to be in spaces, either in patients that are maybe a little bit bigger right. or have had something else done before that would be very limited visually. Um, laparoscopically and we are able to do very you know make very fine movements with these robotic instruments but it's still us controlling it um, but it really it, it's a game changer I think for um, for the treatment of colorectal cancer how is the and, and a little bit of uh, being naive to the process and being in there with the robot but how is the visualization improved and, and you touched on it being much better but what kind of technology is there to make the visualization better? Yeah, so it's it's a neat technology where um, you know basically the the robot is attached to the patient uh, and it's communicating through these small ports that the instruments go through, mm -hmm. and then there's a camera uh, and the the way the camera generates the image on on the console where the surgeon's sitting, it's almost a three D image. Mm -hmm. um, so things look look bigger than they are inside the body, which allows us to see better. Uh, and the precision, it just the, the accuracy of what you can see, you know, and to some of these planes, <clears throat> tissue planes in, in like tough rectal cancers, you know, that can make a lot of difference in how someone's going to do surgically. Uh, in, for me, I, I think it really adds a lot to the surgical treatment. Yeah. I mean, I think I, I only have the experience of, you know, being an intern or a med student and sitting in on some of these, but just the difference from a student's perspective when you're you know, yeah. looking at the laparoscopic ones I attended versus the robotic ones, I mean, you, it felt like to me you were seeing so much more. And the per the surgeons, you know, they had more of these degrees of freedom and ability to get into mm -hmm. these different planes. So, I think it seems like a where we should be going yeah. for most cases. For, from a selfish standpoint, too, personally, because I'm sitting and doing the same <laughs> surgery versus yeah. standing up at an operating table, you know, either right. holding a retractor or right. um, you know, just the physical stress of surgery is less, which I think is better for career longevity. And what he's not telling you is also longevity of his golf game. Yeah. Well, that, means, that means more work. So. <laughs> yeah, his back's going to hold up longer. Right, so I'm so saying. Yeah, yeah, longer playing career. Yeah, yeah. I like it. <laughs> in ideal circumstances, we're meeting uh, in a multidisciplinary conference when you have a new patient diagnosed with either colon cancer or rectal cancer, and we're talking about the treatment approach together. And we just want to walk through the audience on a potential case and how we would approach it. So if you have a new patient with a, a new diagnosis of colon cancer, um, you know, the staging is important, right? That kind of tells us how, how we should approach the treatment, whether we need to involve, uh, you know, chemotherapy, which is kind of my specialty, whether we need to involve radiation therapy. For Rick, it's usually rectal cancer cases that, that you know, the radiation oncologists get involved. Um, but for a colon cancer case, staging... Stage one and two colon cancers are primarily treated with upfront surgery and, and including stage three, you know, which would be a lymph node involvement. Um, and Alex, could you tell us a little bit about how your surgical techniques might differ for those kind of cases? Do, does it even change in terms of the number of lymph nodes you remove or kind of the, the resection, how, how wide of a resection you do for yep, those cases? Absolutely. Yeah. So like you touched on staging. I think it's important for patients to know, you know, every patient, they want to know what stage are they, because mm -hmm. that's what they hear on television or someone right. in their family asks them. I try to reassure people because sometimes we usually get preoperative um, CT scans to look if the cancer has potentially spread. And that's technically a stage four, which people look up on the internet and it's scary, but I try to kind of reassure them, you know, don't get too involved with Dr. Google um, mm -hmm. because every stage is treatable. You know, they are all treatable. Right. The sequence of treatment may change. You may get chemotherapy before surgery, you know, or you make it a different kind of surgery, but one through four, it's all treatable. So I think that's important. But then if we know up front that it hasn't spread and it's a colon cancer, we usually do upfront surgery. Um, and the way, you know, we look at it is we have to get what's called a margin. Um, so we typically want about five centimeters on either side of the lesion um, mm -hmm. to make sure that we've gotten out enough normal colon that there's no microscopic spread of the tumor. Mm -hmm. And then the standard of care is that you need at least 12 lymph nodes in, as well to make sure you've adequately staged those. 
Um, the lymph nodes are microscopic, typically, you know, unless they're very enlarged for some reason. I don't see them in the surgery. But so when I go after lymph nodes, it's basically based on certain blood vessels of the colon. Mm -hmm. So on the right colon, um, there's an artery called the iliocolic artery. And on the left side, there's different arteries as well. So I have to find those in the operating room and basically um, take part of those arteries out with the colon. And that kind of ensures that we get enough lymph nodes. Um, and then, you know, the pathologists help us by finding them microscopically, which is fairly tedious. Um, but basically, I try to treat every colon cancer exactly the same, just to standardize my approach to right. making sure we're surgically doing a good job and also getting you guys enough information to treat them, you know, with the newer chemotherapies and other types of therapies that are out there now. Right. Um, but that's yeah. basically it. I, I go and find a blood vessel at the beginning of every case, start there, and then I take out the other part of the colon. Yeah, I think colon cancer, too, is, I mean, there are other cancers like this, but I think still one of the, I would say, less common situations where so much of how what guides therapy is dependent upon what, what you do at surgery, Alex, what you remove, and then what the pathologists see mm -hmm. under the microscope. Because I think we've all seen cases where patients get a CT scan or a PET scan, and you see some very large mass or it looks really, really bad on imaging, but then when it's removed and they look at it under the microscope, it may have been big in size, but it wasn't very invasive or it didn't spread to lymph nodes. So I think that's unlike other cancers we treat and have talked about right. obviously on this show before, I think that's what makes colon cancer a little bit unique is it, it, for folks who don't do this regularly, I think it's a little you know, counterintuitive for them. So I think it just it speaks to how important it is to get the appropriate surgery done and then the appropriate pathological staging and really how you're really are the captain of the ship w with colon cancer because if it's not if we don't get that information or you know we don't have all those tools then Danny you can't make you know what you decisions you need to make on the adjuvant side prognosis can't really be informed that well so right. I think it's just something to you know for the listeners to hear just because it is a little different than some other types of cancers we've talked about yeah it's almost impossible to give patients that prognostic right. information, treatment recommendations until the <clears throat> surgery is done, until the pathologist looks at the specimen and says, this is what I see, you know? So, um, so a majority of the time we're seeing patients after surgery mm -hmm. and going over the pathology with them to kind of guide the treatment from there. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think patients always want to know, you know, a frequent yeah. question I understand is how big is it? How big is the right. tumor? Um, and we try to explain to them that, you know, it could be one centimeter, but very invasive or in the lymph nodes. And that's something you want to worry about a little bit more than something that could be 10 times that big, but it's very superficial, hasn't gone anywhere. So it's unlike some other cancers like, you know, breast cancer, or other things you guys I'm sure have touched on, um, where until you really break it down microscopically with the pathologists who are a key part of the team, you don't know what the stage is going to be sometimes. You know, you don't know what the treatment plan is going to be. Um, and the only way to figure that out is by doing the surgical the surgery right. there. Well, I think it also speaks to your earlier point about, you know, the upfront staging with the imaging, where even if you find a cancer spot in the liver that may, we think started in the colon and we prove it, you know, there are different, we now know, thanks to, you know, better information and clinical trials that stage four disease is made up of multiple types of patients. So not all stage four disease is, you know, what we traditionally thought of as, you know, incurable, you know, short-term prognosis, that sort of thing. So, Avoiding the Google machine, and I say the same thing to my patients, is key because your situation is your situation, and we're giving you the recommendations and the information based on your situation, not necessarily if you just Google your generic diagnosis because there's a bunch of information out there that some of it may be relevant to you and some of it may not be relevant to you. So I think that's right. just important to, yeah. to touch on too. All right, Rick. I'm a little disappointed I didn't get to tell my dad a joke in the beginning of this part one of colorectal cancer can i tell it now i see your tears so i guess we'll, we'll allow it all right what do you call a chameleon who can't change colors a camilla can't a reptile dysfunction <laughs> nice <laughs> thank you <laughs> thank you i tried it on my wife earlier she didn't like it very much but i all right so I'm moving on so <laughs> so producer brennan was right this episode clearly is going to extend into two parts um dr Crean, thank you so much for your time and we look forward to continuing thanks, this for conversation next week on the second part but um with that i think uh we'll, we'll close it out till next week thanks so much for coming back and joining us for another episode of medical minute if you have any suggestions on things we should talk about 
questions you'd like answered, or you just want to say hi, please email us at medicalminute at csnf.us. And make sure you follow us on social media, search Cancer Specialists of North Florida on Facebook and underscore CSNF on Twitter and Instagram. As always, we appreciate you giving us a few minutes of your time, and we hope you learned something today. And remember, when it comes to your health, sorry, and remember, (laughs) I'm having trouble reading, and remember, when it comes to your health, stay informed. Ask questions, and and tune tune in next time. time.